We now come to our main event. The center established the Thomas Cooley Distinguished Judicial Lecture to honor Thomas Cooley's tenure as the Chief Justice of the Michigan Supreme Court. Our inaugural Cooley lecturer was the Honorable Judge Joan Larson, who before joining the Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit had served as a justice on the Michigan Supreme Court. Tonight we will hear from our second Cooley lecturer, the Honorable Judge Naomi Rao of the DC Circuit Court of Appeals. In her service in all three branches of government, Judge Rao has shown both a devotion and an ability to bring the federal government closer to the, structural, the structure originally enacted by the founders. And her scholarship has been particularly effective in demonstrating that there are in fact three and only three branches of the federal government as originally understood. Judge Rao graduated from Yale College in 1995 and University of Chicago Law School in 1999. Following graduation, she served as a law clerk to Judge J. Harvey Wilkinson on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit and then as a law clerk to Justice Clarence Thomas. Between her clerkships, yes, we can give Justice Thomas a nice round of applause. Between her clerkships, Judge Rao served as counsel for nominations and constitutional law to the U.S. Senate Committee on the Judiciary. From 2005 to 2006, she, she served as the Special Assistant and Associate White House Counsel to President George W. Bush. From 2006 to 2017, Judge Rao was a professor at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University, <laughs> where she taught constitutional law, legislation, and statutory interpretation and the history and foundations of the administrative state. In 2014, she founded the Center for the Study of the Administrative State, a nonprofit that promotes academic scholarship and public policy debates about administrative law. In July 2017, she was appointed to serve as the administrator of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs in the Office of Management and Budget. She served in this position until her appointment to the DC Circuit by President Donald Trump. It is my great pleasure finally, after two years, to introduce Judge Naomi Rao. Thank you so much. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here in this amazing space, um, surrounded by our country's great documents. I want to thank Lee Otis. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to be sponsored by the Federalist Society. Lee has been a tireless defender of constitutional principles throughout her service um, in government and at the Federalist Society. And I was one of the many young lawyers that she has encouraged along the way. And I'm, I'm grateful for her friendship. I'd also like to congratulate Professor Whittington and Professor Wilentz on receiving the Kool-Aid Book Prize. Uh, what a tremendous honor. And, Again, because of the pandemic, we kind of get two for one, so, so that makes things a lot of fun. And, and thank you so much to Randy Barnett and the Georgetown Center for the Constitution for hosting this wonderful event and this remarkable space um, after so many pandemic delays. I think there was at one point we were going to do all of this over Zoom, and I'm so glad that we did not. <clears throat> okay, so my topic for tonight's speech is the province of the law. I aim to mark out the boundaries of this province and to consider what lies within its substance and its soil. The province of the law matters because as Alexander Hamilton said, the interpretation of the law is the proper and peculiar province of the courts. To take the meets and bounds of the province of the law should reveal something then about the judicial province and judicial duty. My starting point is that law has a province. To make such an assertion is already to stand on one side of many important jurisprudential debates. It assumes that within our constitutional system, law has a distinct domain and legal interpretation is a distinct enterprise not to be confused with abstract moral philosophy or economics or political theory. Such ideas were once commonplace, but today are often supplanted by legal theories that both deny the boundaries of the law and corrupt its substance. 
We have followed the fabled path of the law further and further away from our constitutional origins. Rather than go any further, we should turn back to the idea that law has a province. It is a place, not a journey. My lecture will proceed as follows. I begin by explaining the concept of law's province. Thinking about the law as a province suggests that the law has limits, but also that it has substance, the soil that makes up our legal traditions. The limits of this province and its distinct content shape the judicial duty. I will then turn to exploring these two aspects of the province of the law, its limits and its content. First, the boundaries of law's province have come under siege from many different directions. Living constitutionalism and an unbounded administrative state are just two. In response, originalists and textualists have sought to emphasize that law has boundaries. Legal interpretation requires determining the original meaning of the Constitution and what Justice Scalia called the fair construction of statutes. Much of the conservative legal movement's efforts have been to rebuild the proper borders around the province of the law. And this has been important and essential work to understand the nature of law, to consider the proper role of judges, and to expound the distinct powers vested in the political branches. Second, the province of the law is more than just its boundaries. The terrain of our law includes the foundational political theory animating the Constitution not to mention roots resting in the common law and natural law. To interpret and apply our laws correctly, we have to unearth and examine our distinctly Anglo-American legal principles and constitutional commitments. The proper and peculiar province of the courts is to interpret the law, staying within law's province and drawing from its rich history and traditions. For those who believe, as I do, that law has a province, we must focus on the task of, underlying, of understanding what belongs to it. Appreciating our laws with humility and respect for preceding generations will promote, as Lincoln said, the perpetuation of our political institutions. This lecture aims to serve as a kind of response against those who would deny the boundaries of law's province, leaving only a wilderness of evolving norms, abstract justice, or something like the common good. It's an affirmative case for the province of the law. To understand this province and the province of the courts, the best place to start, of course, is with the Constitution. We are, after all, at an event hosted at the Georgetown Center for the Constitution and here at the National Archives, just a few feet away from an original copy of the Constitution. Our Constitution establishes what counts as law and how it must be enacted. The Constitution also establishes and limits the powers of the three branches of government, powers that, importantly, are vested in particular actors. The legislative power is vested in Congress, the executive power is vested in a single president, and the judicial power is vested in the courts. As Randy said, we have three branches and only three branches. Vesting power in a particular actor grants authority that includes a bundle of duties, many of them exclusive to the particular office. This echoes a fundamental principle of property law, namely that when title to land vests, its owner possesses a specific and exclusive bundle of rights that attach to a particular place. As Madison said in explaining the separation of powers, the interest of the man must be connected with the constitutional rights of the place. My particular concern, of course, is with the federal courts, which are vested with the Article III judicial power. This includes particular duties and obligations that flow from the original understanding of this power. Chief Justice Marshall, echoing Hamilton, famously said, it is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. So understanding what is within the province and duty of the courts requires understanding what is within the province of the law. Hamilton and Marshall's use of province indicates a kind of framework for thinking about law and judicial duty. First, law's province has limits and boundaries. And second, our legal province is made up of the peculiar soil and substance of American legal traditions. Both the limits of the law and its substance are essential for understanding law's province and the province and duty of the courts. 
So let me now turn to what it means for law to have a province, a fixed place with firm boundaries. In our society, the boundaries of law's province are marked out by the Constitution. The Constitution limits the powers of the federal government and establishes what counts as law. One way to appreciate these boundaries is to consider some of the ways in which they have been eroded. I could not possibly detail all of them at a dinnertime lecture, but let me note just a few. The early 20th century progressives waged the first modern assault on the Constitution's exclusive vesting of government power in specific and distinct actors. Give them credit, they were very honest about what they were doing. Woodrow Wilson and others openly stated that the Constitution's protections for individual liberty and rights had to yield to social efficiency and progressive policies geared toward the common good. The progressives maintained that the legislature is too slow the courts too traditional, and the need for progress simply too urgent to leave political reform to the constitutional process. Instead, the progressives borrowed from then popular German social thought in the belief that the collective good required a government of experts. The progressive era ushered in what I will, for the sake of simplicity, call the wilderness theory of law. A wilderness approach promotes an unbounded understanding of government power in pursuit of particular substantive ends. That is, instead of keeping law within its well-defined province, the progressives tore down the fences that separated the legal enterprise from a freewheeling social science inquiry. It no longer mattered that the Constitution vested limited legislative power in Congress executive agencies would now be able to exercise what amounted to the lawmaking power in the name of efficiency. The administrative state allows for the creation of law outside constitutional channels and the imposition of nationwide directives that control the health, safety, and government-defined moral well-being of the people. Many of these agencies combine the exercise of legislative, executive, and judicial functions effectively making laws, enforcing them, and adjudicating public and private rights. We also have numerous so-called independent agencies. Of course, Congress may create those agencies so long as it acts within its limited and enumerated powers. But nowhere does the Constitution allow for the delegation of legislative power, the commingling of government powers, or the executions of the law independent of the chief executive. In the original progressive approach, the power vested in the courts would also have to be diminished. The judiciary could not scrutinize these innovations and state the obvious, namely that many were unconstitutional. Rather, the courts had to adjust to the progressive progress and the progressive project and the sweeping reform of the New Deal. The courts largely stood aside as the fences around law's province were breached and in some places, torn down entirely. While the courts thus retreated from enforcing the Constitution's actual boundaries, some judges also ventured out on new paths, far from law's province. Courts had long recognized the duty to say what the law is, to say what was within the province of the law. But the Supreme Court gradually decided it would say and enforce what the law should be, that it would impose judge-made rules based on new concepts of liberty and reliance on the social good. Wholly apart from the Constitution's amendment process, jurists such as Justice Marshall and Justice Brennan emphasized that an enlightened Supreme Court should further amorphous values like human dignity and develop new variants of liberty and equality grown not from our legal soil, but from select contemporary values. Spitting rights from the emanations and penumbras of the Constitution, the courts further pushed law into the wilderness, far from its origins and roots. Against these attacks, many people in this room have sought to restore the province of the law, to fix, as it were, the fences that surround it. Judges and scholars have articulated theories of textualism and originalism, which depend on the claim that law has a determinate meaning these approaches to interpretation restored the old fences and returned to a traditional American way of thinking about law as preserving specific content and specific limits. Proponents of textualism and originalism pushed back against the skepticism about law's meaning from progressives, legal realists, and living constitutionalists. 
Marking the boundaries of the law also helped to mark the boundaries of judicial power, its proper and peculiar province. Most judges now at least claim to follow a text-first approach to statutory interpretation and to recognize the importance of the original meaning of the Constitution. We're all textualists now, said Justice Kagan. This recognition makes it harder, perhaps impossible, to justify the wilderness theory of law, the judicial creation of entirely new rights. Importantly, following the original meaning of the Constitution or the text of a statute is the best way to respect the moral and political choice of the American people to ratify the Constitution and its particular structure of lawful government. The people did not agree to a legal wilderness, nor did they choose an unbounded government. Rather, the people chose a government with separated and limited powers, a structure they believed would best prevent arbitrary rule and preserve their individual liberties, social, religious, and economic. These efforts to explain the reasons for law, law's boundaries are now familiar, and the at least partial success of textualism and originalism is undeniable. In our constitutional system, what counts as law is limited, as are the powers of the three branches. Text-based and originalist interpretation respect the boundaries of law's province and the fundamental moral choice of the people to live under a government of laws and not of men. So that brings me, perhaps, to the heart of this lecture, to a consideration of what is inside our legal province. Fixing the fences around the province of the law has had a tremendous impact on our legal culture and on the courts. To understand the province of the law, however, requires more than marking out its boundaries. It also requires understanding what properly exists within the province, within the soil and foundations of our law. In light of contemporary debates about interpretation, it seems increasingly obvious that it is not sufficient for judges merely to stay nominally within law's province. Rather, we must also endeavor to understand what is properly within it. Critics of textualism and originalism often equate formal methods of interpretation with literalism as utterly empty and indifferent to truth. But textualism and originalism are far from empty procedural methodologies. They require understanding the substantive content of law's province. Last month in a different lecture, I discussed what I called the political morality of textualism, by which I meant the deep moral foundations of textualism's claim that, that statutes must be interpreted by their terms and in light of long-standing background principles and legal reasoning. Constitutional interpretation and the search for original meaning similarly occur within the context of our Anglo-American legal history. Originalism and its, all its variants are part of a robust dialogue in the academy, and it seems even somehow on Twitter. And I will not delve into those particulars tonight. Rather, I wish simply to recognize that originalism incorporates a substantive legal background that matters when judges are faced with difficult constitutional questions. While breaking new constitutional ground is a task primarily for the Supreme Court, even on the DC Circuit, I've had to decide a number of novel constitutional questions, questions that require ascertaining the original meaning of constitutional provisions. In doing so, I've come to appreciate the many layers of reasoning that are required. At one level, there's the specific meaning, the, the meaning of specific words or phrases, how they were used and understood at the time of ratification, how they were defined, perhaps, in Samuel Johnson's founding era dictionary, and how they appeared in debates, such as those between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. In addition to the linguistic inquiry, the province of the law also includes deeper roots. For example, the meaning of the Constitution reflects the political theory that influenced the framers. The framers drew from thinkers such as Locke, Hutchinson, Vattel, Montesquieu, Blackstone, and others. When the people ratified the Constitution, they made a moral and political decision to establish a government authority with certain limited lawmaking powers for the good of society. That decision itself incorporated prior natural law reasons for having law, for creating and living within a defined province of law. 
The Anglo-American legal tradition also draws from the Roman law, civil law, and the natural law, but it has incorporated these in a unique way. Any reference to these sources must be bounded by our constitutional system of government. Justice Thomas, for whom I was so fortunate to clerk, frequently pulls together these sources when interpreting the Constitution, particularly in some of his masterful separate concurrences and dissents. He interprets the Constitution in light of foundational and theoretical principles undergirding our great document. For example, when explaining why Congress cannot delegate legislative power, he rightly relied on principles about the relationship between private rights and government power that profoundly influenced the men who crafted, debated, and ratified the Constitution. Justice Thomas's understanding of separation of powers draws on what he called the ancient roots that are part of our law. And he recognizes that the scope of individual constitutional rights, such as the Second Amendment right to bear arms, cannot be fleshed out with reference to the text alone. Instead, he has looked to the Magna Carta and the English Bill of Rights. In analyzing the meaning of the Constitution and understanding its legal background, we, we must be mindful of the animating spirit and the institutional structure of our law. We must draw on our distinctly Anglo-American legal reasons and principles, which is to say that we cannot look to any source that pleases us in the present to dig around the province of someone else's law to chart our own. Our province reflects the exceptionalism of the American legal context, which locates the sovereignty of government in the people. Our constitutional government emphasizes a certain kind of civil liberty that encourages hard work, entrepreneurship, and strong communities. As George Washington recognized in a letter addressed to the Hebrew congregation of Newport, Rhode Island, quote, the citizens of the United States have a right to applaud themselves for having given to mankind examples of an enlarged and liberal policy, a policy worthy of imitation. And that policy, he noted, required industrious and good citizens. And with such a policy and with such citizens in mind, President Washington cited the book of Micah and expressed his hope that everyone shall sit in safety under his own vine and fig tree and there shall be none to make him afraid. In exploring the province of the law, we might not always agree about what is there. The political philosophy behind our constitution may at times be contested but it is something more determinate than abstract ideals of a good or favored moral philosophy. Finding the correct interpretation within our province may sometimes be difficult and judges may make good faith mistakes. Disputes will arise as in many other legal inquiries, but that is not a reason to duck hard questions about what is necessary, necessarily and properly within our legal terrain. This ongoing deliberation is essential because the province of the law is not static, far from it. The scope of the law regularly changes based on legislation enacted by Congress. The Constitution may be amended, creating a more fundamental shift in the boundaries of law's province. Courts continue to decide cases and further articulate the meaning of the laws. But new statutes, amendments, and precedents cannot be understood except by reference to what already exists within law's province. This perspective can help us to identify what is not properly within the province of the law, to state with reasons why certain concepts or doctrines are simply weeds, foreign invaders that have taken root. It is the proper and peculiar province of the courts to interpret the laws to keep the garden cultivated and free of such weeds. In keeping with this analogy, Chief Justice Marshall and other early jurists often refer to improper and outlandish interpretations as wild. Wild was defined at the founding to mean untamed, without cultivation, uncivilized. In contrast to wild interpretations, the orderly province of the law includes principles drawn from the text and structure of the Constitution. Early jurists had no difficulty discarding the arguments they deemed wild and inconsistent with our cultivated law. Faithfully exercising the judicial duty requires stating what the law is and what is simply too wild, too foreign to be considered a part of our law. 
And by pointing to the outlandish, the wild, the judiciary keeps the other departments in check as well, setting down markers for what types of legislation and execution are within the province of the law and what will be de deemed outside of it in the wilderness. The political branches also have an obligation to maintain the province of the law, of course, but within their own particular spheres. When tending to law's province, judicial precedents can raise particularly difficult questions. Judges conventionally follow stare decisis, standing by what has already been decided. But sometimes things are decided incorrectly and at odds with the Constitution and our legal foundations. They are, in a sense, invasive species within law's province. Judges are cautioned to stand by even these decisions, to simply settle the dust around these strange plants, perhaps to prune here and there and hope the weeds stay within their little plots. Yet part of the judge's duty is to say what the law is within our peculiar and proper province. In so doing, judges must point out the precedents that don't fit. And this takes some work because human beings are adaptable and quickly grow accustomed to new landscapes. Part of the judicial power requires identifying and uncovering what has been grown over to help people to see the broader context, not just the latest and brightest foliage. It should go without saying that in our constitutional republic, judges cannot introduce new laws or impose new values. But sometimes judges introduce the weeds, and it may fall on later judges to pull them up. So judges must tend to the new and the old, saying what the law is and how it fits together. Of course, this is a task that must be undertaken with good judgment and learning and a fair measure of humility because law's province is extensive and complex. Yet again, the difficulty of the task does not erase the duty of the judges. So let me just bring this lecture to a close with a few final thoughts. There is at present an understandable and rising frustration with literalism and shallow linguistic positivism. The solution, however, is not to tear down the boundaries of the law or to import new abstract ideals. Rather, we must focus on understanding the particular substance of our laws. Law's province has both limits and substance. The judicial duty requires both staying within law's limits and deciding cases in light of deep and rich legal foundations. And by insisting on a province for the law, I must admit to an institutional ambition for the courts. Often the lack of legal boundaries is associated with judicial supremacy and the expansion of the judicial power. I think this is a mistake, certainly a mistake in the long run. If there are no boundaries to the law and no limits to the judge's province, then the importance of judgment dissipates. Without law, there is only will and politics, and judges, as we know, have neither force nor will, but merely judgment. Judges have no law to interpret if their province is a legal wilderness governed by abstract reasoning about justice, efficiency, the common good, or whatever philosophy is most in vogue. If it is the peculiar and proper province of the judiciary to say what the law is, in the absence of any defined province, the judiciary will eventually become irrelevant. Invoking judicial legitimacy by sitting on the bench and letting the weeds take over will preserve neither the courts nor the law. Law is not a path moving further and further from its origins, but a province in which new things may be built by the people but within constitutional limits and rooted in our distinct legal soil. Thank you. Well, that was worth the wait.
Naomi, it's my great pleasure to uh, present you this token of our appreciation for this magnificent lecture, uh, the 2021 Thomas Cooley Judicial Lecture. It reads in a quotation from Thomas Cooley, sovereignty is in the people and the legislatures which they have created are only to discharge a trust of which they have been made a depository, but with well-defined restrictions. That's Thomas Cooley with our compliments. Thank you. So, as I mentioned, this fall will mark the center's 10th year anniversary. On Friday, October 14th, 2022, we will award the fifth annual Thomas M. Cooley Book Prize of $50,000 to Stanford Law Professor Michael McConnell and hear from our Cooley lecturer, Judge Don Willett of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. I hope to see all of you there. We are now adjourned. Thank you.